Hello everybody and welcome to this next episode of Into the Prey, Breaching the Chaos of the Church with Nick and Mary Franks. This is of course a very special Easter Sunday session and most people listening to this will be expecting some kind of uh, continuation of the City of Temples. We're in chapter 7 of that but today I wanted just to pause on that series um, just to kind of go through some other scriptures and this isn't expository this morning, it's more just sharing my heart a little bit about Easter and Easter Sunday in particular, the the whole morning of resurrection, he is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Um, but there's just a couple of scriptures that I want to share with you that I hope will exp- give a little bit of insight into my thinking. Um, and I think specifically to do with the prophetic, um, what what's truly prophetic in our day and age. There's lots that isn't prophetic or that is stylized by way of denomination or movement or whatever but um, I think there's something of Sunday morning I want to just say this before turning to Luke 24 and then Luke 21 so just get flick those uh, pages open to your Bible if you can Um, I want to just say this morning that this is the way that Easter normally goes okay Easter normally goes less buoyancy on a Friday on the good Friday we come through Monday Thursday into Friday and there's this sense of kind of reflection and uh, slightly more melancholic reflection, um, focusing on the suffering of Jesus and all of that is good. You know, we learn that from the Jewish culture, the Jewish ancestry, as it were, is that it's good to have days, it's good to have, um, it's good to have times in our normal lives where we stop and pause and have specific focuses. So there's nothing wrong with, with that. So there's that, that sense of Friday, Good Friday, and then there's kind of like a, a bank holiday feel <laughs> of of the Saturday. And then, you know, Sunday morning comes of Easter. And that's that's this morning I'm talking to you live, as it were. There's this kind of like sudden sense of maybe genuine, I mean, buoyancy. It's good to have buoyancy, isn't it? And I think when we remember that the, the Lord rose, that the tomb is empty, um, there is a buoyancy. You know, if the sun's shining, people have got a bit of lamb in the oven and there's some chocolate eggs, you know, And on top of all of that, we know that Jesus is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen and there is a buoyancy. I'm wanting to challenge that this morning. I'm wanting to challenge that the way that we have that rhythm of melancholic reflection, bank holiday vibe, and then this buoyancy on the Sunday morning. And part of the reason is I wanted to be honest this morning, say that, and I've noticed this of myself in the last few years, um, coming to Sunday morning, of Easter, I generally don't feel buoyant at all. I, I actually, and again, this is this is my testimony this morning, is that I don't feel buoyant. I don't feel the exhilaration of resurrection. I actually feel the opposite. I actually tend to feel more sad, as it were, on Easter Sunday morning than I would do on a Good Friday. And I want to try and explain a little bit why that is. Um, and again, keeping in mind this prophetic, the prophetic element, divine pathos. If you don't know what divine pathos is, um, I haven't got time to explain that now. Divine pathos is something that Abraham Heschel talked about in his his classic book, The Prophets. Um, and I gave a whole chapter to Embody Zero, so you can find that. Um, write to me if you'd like that. I can give you that for free if money's an issue or whatever. Divine pathos. And I want to I wanna explain that this morning. Um this is very fresh because it landed with me this morning as I was reading. And um, so let's go to the, these scriptures now and I'll try and just explain what I mean about challenging this melancholic Good Friday, bank holiday, Saturday buoyancy. Of, I, I want to challenge that as a curve um, because I don't think it's the way that we're supposed to be. Um and at the same time, I think it's, I don't think the answer is, and let me be clear, I don't think the answer is that everybody's melancholic on Sunday morning of Easter. Of course not, that would be obscene. What I'm challenging, though, is is something else. So let, let's just go to, um, let's go to Luke 24, first of all. I want to just read some passages, two two main passages, and then try and give you some thoughts um, that I've had this morning. Okay, so Luke 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
And then it might just be worth underlining some of these words. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered. They remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who had told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, and he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. Look at those words. In verse 4, they were perplexed. Verse 5, and they were frightened. And then this issue of remembrance comes into play. Uh, I'm just going to skip now on to the next bit, because just keep in mind that whole thing of they're perplexed, they're being perplexed, they're being frightened, but then into this mix into this crucial mix, remembering Good Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This issue of remembrance. Remembrance is so, so important. Look at this on the road to Emmaus. Let's just jump. For the sake of time, I won't read the whole passage, but jump to verse 17. So if you remember, um, two of the disciples, one of them was called Cleopas, um, were on the road to, they were walking to a, a village called Emmaus. And this was after everything that had gone on in the preceding day or two. Um, and then if you remember Jesus himself, the resurrected Lord of glory, draws alongside them, but they didn't know they didn't know who it was. And that, that's what's happened here. So verse 17, so Jesus has come alongside them and he said to them, what, what is the conversation, conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And when, I want you to notice that. They were having a conversation as they walked and they stood still looking sad so jesus had come alongside them while they'd been discussing and you can imagine that the nearest and dearest conversations that you have with your best friends with your spouse with whoever those kind of conversations you're just going over you know really much like these podcasts that mary and i have regularly you know these kind of conversations jesus comes alongside and the two disciples stopped um you can understand that if you were walking along the road and somebody drew alongside you, you might stop. But look what it says. They stop, but they, but, um, sorry, verse, um, this is 17. And they stood still. Looking sad. Just remember those first verses of um, chapter 24. They were perplexed. They were frightened. You know, you, you can imagine the other emotions that aren't mentioned there, confusion being a major one. And this sense of paralysis. Um, so the two wrote, the, the disciples on the road to Mess and Jesus comes out and their, and their response is to stop. And they looked sad. And this and this is this is this is my emotion. Okay, so I'm being honest with you this morning. This is how I felt this morning waking, and this is what I've noticed over the last few uh, Easter's, I think particularly as we've come away from the church institution and all the traditions and all the religion and all the legalism and all the deadness of that system. Part of the sadness I feel on Easter Sunday morning, I think, is, I mean, I could talk about it at length, but one of, one of the main things I feel is just the sense of sadness that there isn't resurrection <laughs> power evident among us. I know that positionally we are resurrected, of course, and there is deep joy. Joy is so misunderstood, guys. You know, joy is not getting up on a on an Easter morning. I mean, it's the, the early church father, John Chrysostom, said, for the Christian, every day is Easter. Every day is Christmas. Every day is Pentecost. Joy is not getting up on a Sunday morning that happens to be Easter and having this kind of transient, momentary, passing sense of buoyancy and hope. That's not joy. Joy is being gripped by the reality of this resurrected man that who's coming again every single day 
of your life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain, said Paul in Philippians 1. And John Chrysostom was so right. Every day is Easter. Every day is Christmas. You know, C.S. Lewis echoes that in, in, the, in the line The Witch in the Wardrobe, doesn't he? But every day is Pentecost. Every day is Easter. And so when we have this kind of like what feels like a transient cycle every year, Good Friday, everybody that normally wouldn't be saying much or thinking much particularly boldly about Jesus suddenly has this obsession with his suffering. Well, what about his suffering throughout every other day of the year? What about the glory of his resurrection throughout every single other day of the year? What about the bold proclamation of the message of repentance every other day of the year? And so I can relate, and I hope this is just, I hope this isn't discouraging. I want to come to something that is really encouraging, that the disciples stopped as Jesus came alongside them on the road to Emmaus, and they they looked sad because they had, what does it say? Um... Just jump to verse 20 of chapter 24. It says, and um, this is them explaining, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered Jesus up to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped, verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. You know, God calls us and God calls, God calls all of us to hope, not to have hoped. And it's easy, I think, at this juncture of church history, and again, this is just me being honest, one of the reasons I feel sad on Sunday morning is just thinking of all the the rhythms of the church that are so disconnected from true gospel joy. The kind of joy that if you just look back in... um, uh, when Peter ran to the the, the tomb, if you just look back in verse... um, if you look back in verse uh, 11, okay, so the Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of J- James, had had this angelic vision. And again, just to remind you that the angelic message really was to say, remember, remember what had been said. What, remember specifically what Jesus said back in Luke 19 or wherever it was that he was going to suffer, that he had to suffer, that he had to be crucified, and that he would rise again. So the, the angelic vision, the angels were saying to these, these women, remember, remember what Jesus said. And then here we have the women coming back um, and reported what had been said, what had gone on in the, in the empty tomb. And look what it says in verse 11, but these words, this report of that vision, seemed to them an idle tale, thinking of these disciples on the road to Emmaus, they'd stopped. They'd become temporarily idle, as it were. They'd, their posture had changed. Their actual, their literal walk had changed. These, these words seemed to them an idle tale, verse 11, and they did not believe them. So unbelief, paralysis, fear, perplexity, confusion. Verse 12, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb. This is what often feels so missing to me about Easter Sunday morning in the church generally is the absence of that posture change of rising to run to the tomb. Imagine what was going through Peter's mind and through his body, through his heart as he ran. I know we know from from John's gospel that, that Peter was outrun by John. It gives you maybe a bit of an insight into what Peter was like, what he looked like and what his frame was like and so on. Peter was outrun, but nevertheless... Peter went in first and Peter ran to the tomb. Imagine what was going through Peter. He was exhilarated. He was like this homesickness, this confusion. He loved Jesus. Peter rose and ran to the tomb. And then notice stooping, that sense of posture change again, humbling, going lower and looked in faith. And he saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went went home marvelling and what had happened. And that sense of marvelling, that sense of marvel should be, again, John Chrysostom, every day is Easter, every day is Christmas, every day is Pentecost. But this, this thing, gay guys, I want to just leave this with you today. And this is the encouragement for me where I feel sad. I relate to these two guys on the road to Emmaus. I feel sad. Not because I doubt that Jesus has risen, of course not, 
but I don't feel his presence in the way that I want to. And I don't see the church being faithful in the way that we're called to be. There is a sadness to, to Sunday morning. And I want to maybe just release some people for feeling like they somehow need to be buoyant. They somehow need to be joyful. They seem somehow need to be confessing. He is risen. Well, of course he's risen. Of course Jesus is risen. There's more to it than that, isn't there? There's more to it. If Jesus is risen, why are the church unfaithful? If Je Jesus is risen, why is the chaos so, so distressing? I was doing a little bit of research yesterday and again, just into some of our focuses at the minute in the podcast and in our online uh, group together. Jesus, come. You're more than welcome to join if you want to. Uh, thinking about doctrine and false doctrine and error and all that kind of stuff. And I was just doing a bit more research. And the depths of this error, the depths of this deception across the board is, is so discouraging. It's so discouraging. You know, when you hear of the likes of, of Bethel Church, one of the biggest, most popular churches, probably next to Hillsong in the entire world, sending their students out to psychic fairs with effectively tarot card readings to somehow, what, be, a, be an evangelistic presence amongst the occult and, you know, but there's no mention of Jesus. There's no mention of the Father. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to. We don't want to upset people. We want to. We want to be incognito, guys. We, you know, don't tell people about. Don't tell people about Jesus. Tell people about the church, as Paul Scanlon once said to his students at Abundant Life that I was part of. Don't tell people about Jesus. That'll freak them out. Tell them about the church. This is so wrong. The depths of deception, and so this is this is the encouragement for us today and for me today and I feel this buoyancy when I think about this is that if you remember what the angels told the women is to remember um, and verse 8 of, of chapter 24 it says and they remembered his words and that's important and that's what I want us to do today they remembered his words um, and Jesus met, Jesus kind of holds these two guys on the road to Emmaus. He holds their toes over the fire a little bit. And, 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 and in verse 19, Jesus said to them, what things? What things are you talking about? Specifically, it's important to be specific when we, rem when we remember um, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and, and word before, and blah, 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 all of that. But, but we had hoped. And they'd so this whole thing of we had hoped, we have to hope. We, it's no good being hopeful previously. Hence remembrance, we have to be brimming with the things that Jesus has said. So the question for us today is, what has Jesus said? What has Jesus said, church? Those whose hearts are set towards faithfulness, who are not getting caught up in household names just because music and albums and Christian celebrities make it look valid and kosher when it's not. What things do we need to remember? Well, these are the things that we need to remember. In verse 25 of chapter 24, Jesus says to them, O foolish ones, and there's gentleness in that, there's grace in that. This is not a lambasting. Jesus is sensitive to what they're processing and going through. O foolish ones, think of sheep. Sheep are foolish. <laughs> sheep are very foolish, but you love them, don't you? And Jesus is the great shepherd here. He loves them. O foolish ones, and slow of heart. How true is that of all of us? Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken so this is what Jesus is wanting them to remember, specifically their remembrance of what the prophets had spoken. And of course, Jesus went on to open their minds. I think there's a parallel there to uh, God opening the womb. If you read chapter Gen Genesis 29 and so on, where you see God, and we've been talking about this in the IVF podcast, where God opens the womb. Only God opens the womb. Well, similarly here, Jesus opens the mind of Cleopas and the other disciple to understand the scriptures. And that was, of course, a broader picture than just one prophet. It was the prophetic testimony of the scriptures. But for us today, I want to just focus on this, okay? O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, for us, of course, we have the prophetic witness of the of the canon of the Old Testament, the new together and so on. But Jesus is our, is the ultimate prophet, is he not? So when I read that this morning, um, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, I, I'm thinking, okay, Jesus, what have you spoken? So let's go now to look at that verse. Um, let's go to chapter 21. And I may just skip over some of this just for time, but this is the parallel passage. Luke 21 is a parallel passage for Matthew 24, which is the classic chapter in the Bible that people often go to 
to focus on the end times, basically. What, what's going to happen at the time that Jesus is going to return to us? Well, this is a parallel passage. Um, and I want to just read some of these words again just and wrap this up with a couple of thoughts. So jumping into verse 5 of chapter 21. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, teacher, when will these things be and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And Jesus said, see that you are not led astray. Please hear the heart of the Father, hear the heart of Jesus. Gentle and lowly, Matthew 11. In heaven, look at what Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan, old English pastor, Thomas Goodwin, teaches about Jesus. Jesus is, I haven't got time to go into that now, but Jesus loves us. Sinners and sufferers. And he loves us in our sinning. He loves us in our suffering. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin, for they will be comforted. So this is the heart of, of, of God as, he, as Jesus speaks here. And he said, see that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. Many will come in my name, Jesus said. Bill Johnson, Bethel Church, come in the name of Jesus, don't they? Jehovah's Witnesses come in the name of Jesus, don't they? Only difference being really is that Jehovah's Witnesses aren't a household name in most Christian households up and down the length of the country. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And you will hear of wars and tumults. Do not be terrified for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. So remember the angels when the group of women were, were reminded by the angels to remember the words of Jesus. Remember Jesus' words in Luke 19 about his suffering, the crucifixion and his resurrection. Remember what Jesus was now saying to these two guys on the road to Emmaus, to remember all of the words of the prophets and so on. And this is for us today, remembering what Jesus has spoken to us on Easter Sunday morning is where our true gospel joy is, where our true buoyancy is. Rather than this kind of default mode of like, we've reflected on Good Friday, we've had a bank holiday on, on Saturday, and now it's just like, wow, yeah, we've got some lamb in the oven, we've got some chocolate eggs, we might see some family or not this year. This is, this is where it's at. It's remembering what Jesus has said has to happen before he's ultimately going to come. Reading on in, in chapter 21, verse 10. Then Jesus said to the nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Keep in mind Syria this morning. It is a pile of rubble. Think of the displaced refugees, millions of them all over the world. Nation will rise against nation. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences, pestilences. That was Jeremiah's uh, litmus test really for genuine prophecy if you, look, if you check out Jeremiah 28. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you, Christians, faithful Christians, not, not nominal Christians. No one's going to lay hands on, if you're a nominal, lukewarm Christian, no one's going to lay ha a hand on you. So if you want that, fine, jog on. Faithful Christians, they will lay their hands on you and persecute, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. And then, and then underline this, guys, verse 13. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. This will be your opportunity, church, to bear witness. Settle in it, therefore, in your minds. Do not meditate beforehand on how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom. Think of Solomon in 1 Kings 3, which none of your adversities will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. Think of that, being delivered over to a council or a police authority by somebody in your own family. It's coming if it's not already here yet. Verse 17, but you will be hated by all for my name's sake. That's the despising of Isaiah 53, funnily enough. It says that in two, twice in one verse, Isaiah 53, two. 
that Jesus was despised and rejected by men. And that was, you know, again, thinking of Matthew chapter 10, another parallel passage here, you know, we are going to be hated. The faithful in the faithful who are really brimming with resurrection joy, who have this tinged sense of sadness that I'm trying to communicate about today. Uh, you will be despised. We will be hated. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but are not, not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Keeping going just for a few more verses. Verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I can just uh, recommend my friend Christopher Manti's book, Flee to the Mountains. And let those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Remember the angels, remember what Jesus said. Remember Jesus to the, to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember what the prophets have said. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Last few verses, verse 25. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress by the way gerard butler's film um about check it out it's basically like a prophetic film about wormwood you know the, the comet in revelation that's prophesied that will fall to the earth won't check it out it's worth watching it helps to visualize some of this stuff thinking of uh <laughs> thinking of people taking toilet rolls out of supermarkets at the beginning of COVID, the humanity of what will happen in some of these periods that we may live to see. Um, verse 26, people fainting with fear. Remember those words, fear, perplexity, confusion. People fainting with fear, with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Not on a cloud, in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. This is what we need to remember on Easter Sunday morning. When Jesus said to the two on the road to Emmaus, remember all the words of the prophets. For us today, that obviously does include all of the same things that those two would have been remembering from the wider prophetic council of the Bible. But specifically, I think today, for those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, in whose hearts are the highways of Zion, remember specific words of the prophet Christ himself who who prophesied and foretold of all of this that would come upon the earth this is the future this is where we're at we're seeing the, the early stages of this despising of those who love the testimony of Jesus and who want to take the opportunity to bear witness and that's that's the thing our witness despite all of the fear and perplexity and confusion our witness will be Jesus said settle in your mind in advance, not to try and work out what to say, but to rest in the knowledge that in the very moment when this will be required of you, he'll give you words, he'll give you a mouth to speak, he'll give you understanding and wisdom. And so I want to just pray for us now today. Heavenly Father, I thank you that it's okay to feel sad on Easter Sunday morning. That you're not looking for some kind of artificial melancholy sadness on Good Friday to then flick a switch on Sunday morning. Lord, I do thank you for the prophetic pathos, the, the true spirit of prophecy, which is the witness of Jesus. Lord, we, we see such unfaithfulness, such confusion, such deception, particularly of young people. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of, of young people through Bethel Church being sent off to psychic camps as part of their prophetic quote-unquote training. Lord, it's a grief. Great deception in Hillsong and other seek sensitive churches that think it's okay for a, a half-naked cowboy to be prancing around a platform during quote-unquote worship. Cessationism running Rive heretics calling out heretics. Why is it, Lord, that cessationists who mock your spirit are the ones calling out 
other heretics. Lord, we, we long for a faithful bride, a faithful remnant who ravel in worshipful glory in your word and in your spirit, Lord. Please restore the reality that we see in your word so, so clearly. Just simple English ploughboys driving the plough, able to see the simplicity, the simple reality of your word and your spirit. And Lord, we long for that, we're jealous for that, and our hearts in some ways this morning are sad because of the chaos of the church, and yet we know that you call us to remember, and in remembering what you've said in Matthew 24 and here in Luke 21, Lord, that we we, we know that these things are to come upon the earth and to specifically come upon the church, the despising, the hating, upon those whose hearts are set toward you. And so Lord, I ask for, for a deep encouragement of your spirit this morning, that we really would know resurrection joy and that we really would know the brimming sense of buoyancy that you mean us to have by way of peace and joy and comfort. But Lord, I do pray that there would be a sense of you meeting us in our sadness this morning where we don't have the exhilaration that Peter had where his posture changed of suddenly hearing rumours of a resurrected Christ. Lord, that exhilaration of faith as he ran to the tomb. Lord, I pray that you'd give us that this morning where we feel that that is absent. And for verse 28 of this chapter, Luke 21, now when these things begin to take place, when they begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads up, that posture change, Lord that Peter had as he ran to the tomb because your redemption is drawing near Lord I do thank you and we we come to you now Lord remembering our redemption isn't hasn't just drawn near it is drawing near progressively our, the day the day of our salvation is nearer today than it's ever been and your return is, is nearer today than it's ever been so Lord I do pray for that beautiful sense of deep encouragement, Lord, and I pray, prepare your people. Let us know that straightening, that posture change of the corporate church, the Luke 117 preparation of the church, as we become increasingly ready and increasingly prepared for your return and for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We pray together now in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.